Hello again, everybody. We have a, another screencast lecture. This is part three of the What Are Living Things. This one is titled, What is Homeostasis? Homeostasis is one of the five characteristics of living things I'm going to want you to know. Now, a good way to think about homeostasis is to imagine doing an experiment in the classroom. Imagine we're all in the classroom, all your classmates are in there, I'm in there, and we're going to do this experiment. One of the things I want you to think about is how does your body normally react to certain stimuli? For example, how does body temperature respond to environmental temperature? What I mean by that is your normal body temperature for humans, the average normal body temperature for humans, is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. If I was in a room that is colder than 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, let's say the room is 60 degrees, will my body temperature drop to 60 degrees Fahrenheit? If the temperature of the classroom was 100 degrees Fahrenheit, what would happen to your body temperature? This experiment was actually done. We're not going to do it in class because there's really no way that we could control this uh, temperature up to 100 degrees. But let's say we could get the temperature of the room up to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. What would happen to your body temperature? So we're, let's say, for example, we'll uh, take your temperature every 30 minutes that you're sitting in a room that's 100 degrees Fahrenheit. What would happen to your body temperature? Would your body temperature start to increase? Would it decrease? Would it stay the same? Well, what's going to happen is your body temperature is going to stay at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit in general unless something is wrong with you. How does that happen? How can your body stay at 98 degrees Fahrenheit if the room outside of your body is over that temperature, so if it's 100 degrees Fahrenheit? Well, one of the ideas behind that is what's known as homeostasis. That is an organism's ability to keep proper conditions inside regardless of its outside environment. And some organisms are able to do that in different ways. Other organisms need to use outside environment. Like here you see this picture of this lizard. A lizard is what's known as cold-blooded. Its body temperature does not stay the same. It will fluctuate along with the exterior environmental temperature. That's one of the reasons why you're going to see lizards sitting out in the sun on the rocks, or if you have a pet lizard or snake, you have to have a, a heat lamp for it. You go across the hall to Mr. Meek's room, you'll see the lizards with the heat lamps where they can stay warm and they can keep their body temperatures at the proper temperature. That's another reason why you don't see a whole lot of iguanas living here in Ohio. It just gets too cold for them. They're not able to keep their body temperatures warm enough. I remember several years ago I was at Grant Park and I found a iguana that somebody let loose in the in the woods. It was very, very sick and it was dying and it was it was sad. So that is not the proper habitat for an iguana. So make sure if you do have an animal like that that you don't mistreat it by putting it out in an area where it's just not suitable to live. Homeostasis, one of the things about homeostasis is it does require energy to be able to happen. Where do we get the energy to keep our body temperature at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit? Well, you get it from eating food. Uh, you're digesting food, your your muscles, whenever you use your muscles, that actually produces heat. That's one of the reasons why if you start getting cold, you're going to start to shiver. That shivering is a quick contraction of your muscles and that will produce heat and actually raise your body temperature up if you're starting to get cold. If we are getting very warm, if we're in a 100 degree temperature room, obviously you're not going to start shivering. That would be the reverse of what you want to do. So what, what happens, what your body's going to start doing is that it can do things like sweating. So here we have temperature, here's body temperature is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. If you're, if the temperature starts to rise. If your body temperature starts to rise, which it will do if you're in a warm room like 100 degrees Fahrenheit, you're going to get what's called vasodilation. And what, hap what that means is your blood vessels are going to get larger and allow blood to flow easier and it will take heat away uh, from parts of your body. And if it gets cold, you'll get what's called vasoconstriction. So here's your blood vessels. Blood is going to be flowing through the blood vessels, and your blood vessels will constrict. They'll get smaller. It will restrict blood flow because what's trying, what's trying to happen is your body is trying to keep blood in your important areas like your brain and your heart. Your fingers, that's why when it gets really cold, your fingers start to get numb and you don't really use your fingers very well because blood flow is cut off. It's reduced to your extremities that aren't nearly as important to keep you alive. Your fingers start getting cold, your toes start getting cold. That's why if you ever get frostbite, it's often going to happen on your extremities, like your toes, your fingers, before anywhere else because your, your blood is going to try to get to your important parts of your brain and your heart. Basal dilation is kind of this, the opposite idea where it wants to bring blood to your extremities as much as possible to relieve some of that heat from your body. Another example of homeostasis is insulin. When you eat 12 
sugary Snickers bars. Your blood sugar does not massively skyrocket. What's going to happen is your pancreas is going to start producing what's called insulin. And that insulin allows glucose, it allows sugar to get into your blood cells. Without insulin, you cannot get glucose into your blood cells. And you, of course, know that glucose is very, very important. We need glucose to produce energy. You can take your blood sugar with a meter. Here's a blood glucose meter. Here is a pricker. And we are going to use a strip. Now, there will be a little bit of blood here, so if you're extremely squeamish, you could probably skip this, this part, but I don't think it's really that bad. So what we're going to do is we're going to put in a strip into the monitor, and you can see that it lights up automatically. This is pretty neat. And it says to go ahead and put blood on the strip. So I'm going to use this pricker, and I'm going to prick my thumb, last chance, blood. You're going to see blood. And I'm then going to get some blood. Here, here we see... There we go. We've got a nice, good amount of blood there. And then what we're going to do is we're going to put the blood on the monitor, like so. And it said it accepted the blood. And we're hoping to get a sugar score below 100. Oh, 111. That's a little high. Uh, not sure why I got that, but that is a little bit high. But it's not, like, scary high. I mean, you should be somewhere around between 80 and 120. Um, a good blood sugar score, though, for a person is usually 100 or, or between 80 and 100. So we'll have to work on that. I don't know what's going on with that, but hopefully not nothing too major. So this is insulin and how our body's sugar level will change. So what I could do is I could eat a sandwich now, which would have blood sugar, uh, my body will produce more insulin, get the, take the, the, the sugar from my blood, get it into my body cells, and then I'm all set. So my blood sugar is not going to go way high and then drop way low. And it, Insulin helps keep that blood sugar relatively steady, and that is a form of homeostasis. If somebody is diabetic, especially a type 1 diabetic, their pancreas does not produce in insulin. What's called beta cells, they get uh, killed by your own body. So your body, for some reason, thinks that the beta cells are an invader, kind of like a germ. Your uh, antibodies will attack these beta cells and kill them off, and your body is no longer able to produce insulin. Because of that, a diabetic needs to take insulin to by injection uh, to be able to get blood sugar into their cells. Growth and development... Uh, I'm not sure why I put it in here. It's, I think it's just because the other lecture was getting too long for growth and development. So we have a fellow named B.F. Skinner. If you ever take psychology in high school or in college, you'll learn more about this guy. Did some interesting things, reinforcement rewards, and he also did some experiments on superstition. Superstition is kind of like if you ever wore blue socks, you were playing baseball, and you hit two home runs. And you decide, hey, if I, I, I hit those two home runs because I was wearing these blue socks. So next week, I'm not going to wash my clothes. I'm going to wear the exact same blue socks. And then the week, following week, you're wearing the blue socks, and you hit another two home runs. You may start believing that you are doing well because you're wearing those blue socks. Uh, reinforcement reward is what he's, he's uh, really well known for and something that you could probably understand. Here is a video clip to tell you a little bit about Skinner's pigeons, and that's kind of what he's best known for are these pigeons, where he was able to teach pigeons to do different things, and he would use rewards like feeding them to learn how to play ping pong, for example. Let's take a look at this video clip. It's pretty neat. The two uh, pigeons are at either end of a small ping-pong table. One pigeon uh, pecks the ball as it comes toward him and knocks it toward the other pigeon. The other pigeon pecks the ball back across the table. If it goes past one pigeon, the other pigeon can eat, and if it goes the other way, the other pigeon eats. So that there is a real, it's a real game. The uh, pigeon uh, is reinforced for a cross-court shot if that is what gets the ball past his opponent. Can pigeons read? This one gives every indication because he's been taught to distinguish between two words and to behave appropriately. He's learned his different response to each sign by being rewarded with food. So the bird isn't acting independently. Its behavior is shaped by controlling its environment. 
Pigeon learned that pecking the disc produced a reward. Then the behavior of pecking could be studied in relation to how often that reward was offered. So conditioning, these trainings, does it work on people? Do people get rewarded and then reinforced and then they continue to do that behavior if they get reinforced? Or they may stop doing a behavior if they get, it, if they get punished for it? Yeah, that does kind of work on people. And a couple examples of that would be like on the right would be gambling. You may know some people who go to the casino or, or gamble. Uh, slot machines will give you a reward. Like maybe you'll play it. 12 times you lose, then you win one, and it gets, they have bells and flashing lights, and it's real exciting, and so you're, you want to continue to do it. Oh, I'm going to try it again. I don't want to miss out on, on getting that big payoff. Uh, you're probably more fil familiar with these apps, like Animal Crossing is a great example of this, where they kind of trap you, where if you don't come in and check on your, your town every once in a while, your town starts degrading and falling apart. So they train you to continuously check in on your animals. Um, or town or whatever. I don't play it. I know my kids do, so I don't know if they're all animals or just people or whatever. But it does train you and condition you and punish you if you don't do things. If you don't check on your animals all the time, you're going to have a collapsing. It is a big punishment. These things also train you. These, a lot of these, especially the mobile apps, a lot of these are based on Skinner's principles. And look it up online. You'll learn a lot more about it. It's kind of, in the way, some ways, it's kind of creepy how the way these video games kind of control you and punish you, almost to the point where you're really not having fun, but you're unhappy if you're not playing with playing it. Okay, that's we're wrapping up here. So make sure you know these five characteristics of living things. You will need to know these five characteristics. So let's go through it. Let's see if you can think of one. It does not have matter in a particular order, but make sure you know these five characteristics. Here's one, uh, made of at least one cell, so we know that cells are the basic level of organization in living things. We learned about that last year. We should know the levels of organi organization. We should know cells. A whole bunch of cells make tissues. A whole bunch of tissues make organs. A whole bunch of organs make organ systems. And a whole bunch of organ systems work together to form an organism. And check out the video, music video, one of my music videos, it's uh, uh, Every Living Thing is Made of Cells, really good way to remember. My, my, my uh, youngest child, he knows the levels of organization from this song. All, care, all living things use energy and raw materials, so things like proteins, fats, carbohydrates. You, your body and organisms need these things to get bigger, to uh, be able to, to move around, to use energy. Uh, another characteristic is that organisms, living things, grow and develop, and the differences between the two, growing would be more of a physical thing, like I was five foot tall, now I'm six foot tall. Developing would be more of a behavioral thing, like uh, a bird learning how to fly. Living things are able to reproduce. A visual of the species does not need to reproduce. However, the species as a whole must be able to reproduce, or the species will go extinct. And then finally, all living things are able to respond to its environment. So if there's a stimulus response, if the lights get real bright, then your pupils will get small to protect, the, protect your eyes. You don't want too much light on your retina. It could actually cause damage and maybe even blind you if you have too much light going into your retina. So your pupils will constrict and get smaller. If the room is, is much darker, your pupils will dilate. That means it's getting bigger. That will allow more water, or water. That will allow more light to go into your eye, and so your retina gets as much light as possible. You'll be able to see a little bit better. That's uh, one of the things you can do is, let's say, the uh, you know you're going to be going to a dark area. Cover your eyes. Close your eyes for 30 seconds. And then when you open your eyes, your pupils will be dilated, they'll be very big, and you should be able to see better. You should improve your night vision. One of the uh, interesting Mythbusters episodes, they were kind of doing a test on why pirates wore patches, and what they, one of their ideas is, is that the, uh, the patch would help maintain the pirate's night vision, 
as they went above or below deck. So if they're up on top deck and it's light outside, they would keep the patch on. And then when they went on below decks, where it's going to be much darker, you would flip the patch up, and then you'd be able to have uh, night vision. And they, they found that it actually did work pretty well. So that would be an interesting thing for you to check out as well. Well, that's all, folks. Hope you learned something, and we'll catch you next time. Toodles. Be careful, kids. Bye. And have a good night. Oh, and also check out Why Guys Reviews. Check out Why Guys Reviews. Make sure you like it. Yeah. Make sure you comment. Comment below. In Make form. comments. Ask questions. Say anything. Tell me your favorite ice cream flavor. I don't care. And then make sure you subscribe. If you want us, we can... Never mind. Yeah, tell us where, uh, what, what, what uh, restaurant you like Y Guys Reviews to check out next. See ya.